So our next speaker of the afternoon and last one is Frank Petriello. So please, Frank. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I apologize that I couldn't make it in person. So my, uh, the organizers requested that I talk about higher order perturbative QCD and jet physics at an electron ion collider. In order to do that, what I will do is I will attempt to motivate this uh, with the following physics question, um, and that's the question of proton structure. There's many reasons to be interested in proton structure. Uh, they're all very well known. Let me briefly review them here. So there's a question that we still don't know the answer to yet, which is the question of the spin of the proton. In particular, how is the one half that we observe in nature built up of the fundamental partonic constituents? And uh, this is something uh, which is being investigated right now. And the current situation and uh, future situation after EIC running is summarized in this nice plot right here, uh, which shows you in the uh, darker bands the estimated uh, uh, result for the integrated uh, delta glue, the polarized gluon, as a function of a lower Bjorken X cut uh, for various different EIC run parameters. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize on this plot. Oops, sorry, I'm having some trouble here. Uh, okay, one thing I want to emphasize on this plot is the fact that after uh, running of a proposed EIC machine, we'll actually have a precision understanding of this quantity. And this theme of precision is something which is kind of the, the central one of my talk. So again, after EIC running, you can see how much the uh, dark blue bands have shrunk. We'll have a very good understanding of this polarized gluon distribution. So this is one reason to care about proton structure. Uh, there are other reasons, and this is kind of where I uh, am coming at the situation from uh, in my uh, background. It's also critical to the high energy physics program. And what I've done here on this slide is I've uh, shown you a uh, summary of the current theoretical uncertainties on the Higgs boson cross section into various decay modes. That's shown on the right hand side of the slide um, from an atlas summary of measuring the Higgs into gamma gamma ZZ star and WW, which you can see if you look at the errors listed on this table, is you can see that one of the dominant errors is actually the theoretical error. That's shown in the red numbers in this table. And if you look carefully, you can see that the theoretical error actually almost saturates the total systematic error on the Higgs cross sections. You can break this error down, and that's done in this pie chart on the left into its various components. And what you can see is that one of the larger components is actually the understanding of proton structure as encoded in the parton distribution function. You can see uh, two different uh, pieces there. Uh, one of them basically comes, uh, the so-called PDF error is the usual propagation of experimental errors through the PDF fit. The uh, purple one labeled PDF theory is some estimate of how much unknown higher order corrections uh, to the hard coefficient functions used to extract PDFs um, affect the Higgs cross section. The point of this slide is that proton structure is actually one of the largest uncertainties in understanding the properties of the Higgs. And this is where uh, perturbative QCD, part of my talk, comes into it. Uh, in both of these situations, perturbative QCD is kind of uh, uh, the nuisance parameter. In the case of an electron ion collider, what we are interested in is such things as polarized PDFs, higher twist effects, other types of interesting structures of the proton, perturbative QCD is something that interferes with this in which we must disentangle to understand the quantities of interest. It's a similar situation at the LHC where we want to understand the Higgs cross section. We want to search for such things as supersymmetry or dark matter. And again, what we have to do is disentangle perturbative QCD effects from these other quantities that we're interested in. So I, I realize that uh, my uh, talk is mostly on the longitudinal structure of the proton. So I figured I should at least uh, have a quote that uh, is talking about uh, TMD PDFs. So what I've done here is just to illustrate an important point from a quote about uh, TMD PDFs, which is that the quantities such as proton structure, TMDs, whatever we're interested in, in order to extract them, they depend upon the perturbative order that we've calculated the rest of the problem at. So it behooves us to really go to the highest perturbative order possible, and I'll show more examples of that in, in a couple of slides. Okay, so the target that I'm gonna be looking at in this talk, the observable, is jet physics. 
And there's many, many motivations for being interested in jet production um, at a future electron ion collider. I know you've had many talks on this already at the workshop, but let me list a few more here. So one of them is the investigation of proton structure, and that'll be something that I'm focusing on later on in my talk. There are other reasons that I'll just uh, quote and give references for. There's determination of higher twist properties of the proton. There's measurement of the properties of the nuclear, vedum, uh, nuclear medium with event shapes. There's been proposals to measure the strong coupling constant um, using event shapes and deep inelastic scattering. And for this last one, let me just show you a little bit of a plot here on the right, which serves to set the precision goal on uh, many of these measurements. So what this is on the right is a plot of an event shape, the so-called angeninous event shape, which I'll come to later. And as a function of this angeninous, what is shown here is on the y-axis, the theoretical uncertainty in the distribution <coughs> if you assume certain errors on the, either the strong coupling constant alpha s or a non perturbative parameter that enters this uh, uh, distribution known as omega-1. And the main thing I want to bring across from this plot is the following. If we're interested in, let's say, a precision measurement of the strong coupling constant on the order of 1%, which is shown by this blue band on the plot, what you can see is that the relative uncertainty that you wish to get on the cross-section is also of the order of 1% to 2%. So that kind of sets the stage for what kind of precision goal do we have um, for EIC measurements. Okay, continuing. Uh, let me actually... Uh, show a motivational slide, which is uh, kind of where we got into this uh, business and what we got interested in. And that's a following calculation of inclusive jet production through next leading order in QCD perturbation theory. And I, I, think you, I think you've seen this plot at the workshop before, if I understand correctly from the slides, but this was done by uh, the following authors uh, referenced on the slide. And what this is, is a plot of the W differential distribution in jet PT and pseudo rapidity um, this actually shows it as a function of the pseudo-rapidity here at various orders in QCD perturbation theory. So the leading order result is shown in the dashed line on this plot. And the major thing is that when you go to next to leading order, which is shown in red, you see quite a large jump. You see a jump by roughly a factor of two or so. These various other uh, blue and gray dashed and dotted lines, um, I'll actually talk a little bit more about later, they indicate so-called Weizsäcker Williams photon contribution to this cross section. But the major punchline of this plot, which motivated us, was the fact that there are very large perturbative corrections to this process. And the question we pose to ourselves is, can we actually extend the description of such processes to the next to next to leading order level in order to facilitate future precision EIC measurements? And from this, I'll go into my outline. This is what I want to show you in this talk. There's three things that I, I want to show you. The first is an extension of the calculation I just showed you to the next to next leading order level. So inclusive jet production in unpolarized DIS to NNLO and perturbative QCD. And one of our uh, kind of goals and motivations of doing this was to see whether many of the tools developed to better understand LHC physics could be successfully applied to EIC. And that was done in the paper reference there. Now, uh, this polarized proton structure is something we're also interested in. And so what we want to do is we want to extend uh, the PQCD formalism um, that we used for the first calculation. And that's also used at the LHC, the N and the low level. And that was something that we, we did in the, the paper reference there. And finally, uh, what I, I hope to spend most of my time on in this talk is actually investigating what can be learned about polarized proton structure using jet measurements at a future EIC. Okay, so let me begin. Um, I'll begin with this uh, calculation of inclusive jet production in unpolarized deep elastic scattering. So let me uh, just give you my theoretical framework here. And so again, um, this is going to be uh, purely within collinear factorization. So what I'll be doing is looking at jet production using the following uh, factorization theorem, where it's written as a convolution of the usual longitudinal proton with a partonic cross-section and power corrections which are neglected. So the usual DIS process is shown on the left. Um, the relevant uh, aspects of this that are, are important for this talk are in, given there in bullets. So DIS is distinguished by a tagged lepton. 
Um, this introduces a cut of the momentum transfer Q squared and leads to a hard scale being Q. Diagrammatically, at leading order in Q to the perturbation theory, uh, the diagram is just shown um, down below. It's a quark electron scattering. Now, inclusive jet production is a little bit different. Um, one asks for a jet in the final state, and one does not demand to observe a lepton. This actually leads to a different hard scale for the process. The hard scale is actually the, part, uh, the PT of the jet. So at leading order in QCD perturbation theory, these things are identical. You have a, a lepton recoiling against a jet. So they start to differ next to leading order, which is described on the slide that you are currently seeing. So at next leading order, there's a few different things that happen. First of all, there are kind of the standard uh, real and virtual QCD corrections shown in the upper part of this plot. There's uh, virtual gluon corrections. There's real gluon emission. There becomes sensitivity to the unpolarized PDF of the gluon coming from the last diagram on the right. However, there's also a new configuration, and that's the following. You can have a lepton split into a collinear photon and lepton pair and have the photon enter the hard scattering process. These are the so-called uh, Weizsäcker Williams or WW photons you saw on the earlier plot. Um, these is actually where DIS and inclusive jet production are, get distinguished at this order and perturbation theory due to contributions of this form. And just for completeness on this slide, um, the splitting function um, for getting the uh, photon out of the lepton and the relevant uh, associated, if you wish, PDF of a photon and a lepton is shown. Okay, so and again, I stress that this calculation is uh, something that has already been done. It's available in the reference shown in the bottom of the slide. What we wanted to add to this was actually the next, the next leading order corrections to see what happens to the perturbative expansion. And there's a few things that happen at the N and low level. Uh, so first of all, there is actually a, a new contribution that occurs. Uh, it comes when an incoming lepton splits into a quark. And this leads to basically uh, dijet uh, contributions at this order and perturbation theory. And I'll actually uh, come back to this uh, later in the talk when I talk about the uh, polarized collisions. But in any case, this is a new configuration that appears next to next leading order. Um, there are the standard NLO corrections to quark photon scattering. And then finally, there are the genuine NLO contributions to the quark lepton scattering channel. This leads to a host of diagrams as shown on the bottom of this slide. Now, the problem with computing this thing at N and L comes from the diagrams shown at the bottom. These are all uh, singular in a myriad of different configurations, uh, collinear configurations, soft configurations, and for a long time deriving some organizing principle to systematically extract and cancel these singularities between the various diagrams that you've seen was a difficult problem and this is something which has actually received a lot of attention at uh, the LHC, where this percent or few percent precision benchmark is becoming critical. And so what I want to do is I want to describe um, one of the techniques that was used to solve this problem at the LHC and that we're going to use at the uh, EIC in our study as well. Uh, there are many approaches. I'm just picking the one that uh, we happen to be uh, involved in. So this is actually uh, using soft collinear effective theory to facilitate these higher order calculations. And in particular, it uses the event shape variable known as ngeneness. Um, it's defined here on the slide if you don't already know it. It's, uh, you can think of it, if you wish, it's similar to thrust. What you basically do, if you wish, is you uh, partition your final state partons along the whole direction of the process to which they are closest. And that's done by the uh, minimization shown here. The Q sub K denotes the momentum of all final state partons. You form the dot product of these partons with all hard directions in the process, whether it be initial beam directions or final state jet directions. You minimize that. That's effectively a clustering of the partons. And you sum over this minimization uh, of all the partons to get your value for the event shape. Now, there's a very simple intuition associated with this formula. If this event shape variable tau n is close to zero, it means that all the dot products that appear in this formula are close to zero. And that means that every parton in the final state is either soft or collinear to some beam or jet. If tau n is much greater than zero, that means you have at least one additional hard jet in the final state. 
beyond the Born level process that you're considering. So this intuition suggests a solution to the problem of calculating cross sections to the N and the low level in QCD. And this intuition is shown here in the first formula on uh, this slide. What is done is a cut on this endogenous parameter denoted by tau cut is introduced. And the cross section is divided into a piece below the cut, that's the piece on the left, and a piece above the cut, that's the piece on the right. And the intuition as to why this is helpful is the following. If you look at the piece on the right, the above cut piece, what we just talked about in the previous slide was that you have at least more, one more resolved jet beyond that that appears at Born level. And what this means is that the calculation in this region of phase space is effectively next to leading order. Now the part below the cut, it turns out, you can think of it if you wish, as similar to QT factorization. There's a factorization theorem, a resummation formula that exists in this region that gives you a simple way to get at it, a simple way to calculate it. And this factorization formula, in this case for the endogenous event shape, is shown on the bottom of this slide. So this is the differential cross section and endogenous. It assumes that the endogenous scale is much less than any other hard scale in the process. This could be, for example, the PT of the jet in the case that we're interested in. Once you make this, ass this assumption, you can write the cross section as a convolution of various functions. There's a hard function which describes hard radiation. This is process dependent. There's a beam function which describes radiation collinear to an initial state beam. This is a non-perturbative function, but for the uh, large values of endogenous or values of endogenous uh, larger than lambda QCD, you can match this onto the standard collinear PDS. This is a universal function. There's a soft function describing soft radiation that is also universal. And there are jet functions describing radiation collinear to final state jets. These are also universal. So this is how you can write the cross section below the cut. And the way that you gain some mileage out of this is that these functions that appear are simpler to calculate than the full N and low cross section. So that's where you can get some miles with this approach. Okay, so the basic way that you approach this problem, you expand this formula to order alpha S squared, you turn off any resummation that you might have wanted to do in the low tau region. And if you know all of the functions to the appropriate order in QCD perturbation theory, in this case, the N and low level, you can facilitate a, cross, a calculation of the N and low cross section. And indeed, all of these functions are now known um, within the past few years, and I've listed some references down here on the slides. Okay, so this was a very brief description of the technique. There's more details in the, the references given. What I want to do now is I want to go on and discuss some of the uh, phenomenology associated with this. So first, starting with um, unpolarized jet, inclusive jet production. So this is revisiting that plot we saw for as motivation in the beginning of this talk, um, except now extended to the NNL level. So this is again, a differential cross section for inclusive jet production at a future EIC as a function of the jet pseudo rapidity. The various relevant run parameters are shown on the left hand side of this plot. So it assumes 100 GeV and various cuts and uh, PDFs. And the major thing to look at here is the behavior of the cross section as you go from one order in perturbation theory to the next. So from leading order shown in red, to next to leading order shown in green, to next to next leading order shown in blue. And the major message is that the perturbation theory stabilizes when you go to the N and low level. There is no longer a large difference between the blue, grand, the blue band and the green band, unlike the case if you compare the green band to the red band. So that's, that's in a nutshell the message. A second thing uh, to note is uh, shown on the inset on the bottom of this plot. This shows two ratios. It shows the ratio of the NLO cross section over the leading order cross section. That's in red, red stars. And there's also the ratio of the in NLO cross section over the NLO cross section. So what you can see is you can see that the uh, N and LO over NLO, the green one, is fairly flat, but you can see some shape as a function of eta jet. This is the kind of thing where if you're doing a fit of, let's say, collinear PDFs, you don't want to confuse this slope uh, coming from this k-factor with some PDF x dependence. Okay, so now let me take this plot right here and uh, let me uh, show you what motivated us 
to uh, extend uh, this calculation to the polarized case. And that's the following plot, which takes what you just saw and splits it up into the various partonic channels. So these partonic channels are labeled in the plot. Um, I, I won't go through the labels, but the major thing I want to emphasize is the following. There is not a single partonic channel that dominates over all of the available phase space. At negative and low negative values of eta jet, you can see dominance of the quark lepton scattering channel, which is red. But you can see for positive values of eta jet, all the partonic channels contribute. And what this suggested to us was that this process would be kind of an interesting uh, probe of PDFs at an EIC. And in particular, one could hope, at least, that by selecting different regions of jet parameter space, you could access different regions, uh, or, or sorry, uh, different uh, parton distribution functions. So that, that was the goal. So what we wanted to do was study this in the polarized case. Um, and what that required was an extension of this theoretical formalism um, from the unpolarized case where it was developed uh, to handle polarized collisions. Um, so let me go ahead and let me kind of very schematically take that factorization theorem that I wrote down before for the below cut cross section. And let me extend it to the case of longitudinally polarized collisions. So if you do that, there's basically uh, two things that change as shown uh, in the two formulae there. So the hard function changes and the beam function changes. The jet and the soft function uh, know nothing about the polarization of the initial state, so they are the same in, in both of these cases. It turns out that uh, the calculation of the unpolarized uh, hard function and the polarized hard functions are basically identical. If you have one, you, you have the other, um, at least in the form in which you usually calculate the hard functions. The one thing that was unknown was the two-loop polarity dependent beam function, and that was uh, what we needed to calculate. So let me very, very briefly uh, review the calculation of this. I don't want to go into it in detail, but just, just to uh, at least uh, give a little bit of relevant detail. So this uh, polarized beam function is effectively the measurement of, if you take a, um, it's, it's analogous to the usual polarized PDF. Uh, it asks if you have a polarized uh, proton or nucleon, what's the difference in uh, right and left-handed states that you would get out of this? It has a very well-defined operator definition that looks very similar to that for a PDF, a polarized PDF. So there's quark operator with the relevant Wilson lines attached. There's a projection operator in the middle of this that gives is effectively the difference between right and left-handed uh, projection operators. Uh, there's a measurement of a large light co-momentum component that's denoted by omega and up to rescaling. Um, this is just the Bjorken X. And there's a measurement of uh, the ingenuity associated with this. Uh, that's denoted by T in this form. And that probe is the small light cone component. This is a non-perturbative object. But if the ingenuous value T is much larger than lambda QCD, you can match this to the standard polarized PDFs as shown on the bottom of this slide. And so what that means is that what you need to calculate are these perturbative matching coefficients. And again, let me just very briefly show the calculation. Um, I won't go into detail. There's diagrams that you can draw. They have a, a very simple interpretation in terms of the operator definition shown in the previous slide. Uh, there's been a whole machinery developed to facilitate these kinds of higher order calculations, in particular for uh, jet production at the LHC. Um, these go under the names of integration by parts and differential equation identities. Um, you can apply this machinery to this calculation. You have some checks on the calculation. You know both what the UV and IR poles should look like. Um, one technical issue is a treatment of gamma 5. And uh, we uh, use the uh, basically tuff veltman scheme. We do have some internal checks of, uh, of this calculation. OK, um, just to prove that we calculated something, let me show you a formula. Uh, this is for a particular matching coefficient where you have a uh, quark come in. It undergoes collinear emissions. It transitions into uh, a, uh, another flavor of quark. So it's, if you wish, the off-diagonal part of the usual evolution. And uh, this is just a formula showing what these things look like. They're well-defined, simple analytic expressions, and they're ready for phenomenology. Okay, let me go on. 
And uh, let me uh, define the goal of our phenomenological study, what we wanted to do. We wanted to study the sensitivity of inclusive jet production at an EIC to polarized PDFs. And the framework is similar to the unpolarized setup described before. There's basically two major differences. First, uh, just to save some computational time, we worked on the next leading order in QCD. We kind of know just from the studies that we've done that the only effect of NLO is to reduce the scale uncertainty. It's not to shift the central values around in any significant way. Another addition for this study was the inclusion of uh, resolved photons, which uh, we did not uh, include in the initial unpolarized study. So the observable we looked at was a double longitudinal spin asymmetry defined on this slide. Um, just to be clear about what we're including in our calculation, um, I'm showing here diagrammatically what is appearing in our numerator for the spin asymmetry. So there's two parts which map on exactly to what was uh, shown before for the unpolarized calculation. Um, the only difference is now these are convoluted with the polarized proton PDFs um, denoted here as delta F of Q sub P and delta F G over P. The resolved photon piece is shown uh, in, a, in a formula right here. Um, this again comes from the same uh, splitting of uh, lepton into uh, collinear photon that we talked about previously, except now we allow the photon uh, to behave non-perturbatively, which in nature it does. So now this resolved photon piece is sensitive to both the polarized proton PDFs and also the polarized photon PDFs. And as you know, these are also quantities that are not very well known and that there is some interest in uh, uh, examining at a future EIC. Okay, so the message um, that I wanna make here is that inclusive jet production um, is sensitive to both the polarized proton and photon structure. So let me summarize in this table below, um, just the partonic structures that enter the calculation you're gonna see. So the first two channels are the usual one um, associated with uh, deep and elastic scattering at high Q squared. They're the quark lepton and gluon lepton scattering channels. Uh, they're, the sensitivity to PDFs that they have is shown also on this table. There's a host of um, processes that uh, come from collinear splittings that are shown in this table as well and their sensitivity to both polarized proton and polarized photon PDFs is shown. Now, just one comment on the study I'm gonna show you here. Our focus is gonna be on um, studying the polarized uh, distributions of the proton. There's actually a very, a very uh, nice study of the polarized distribution of the photon in the literature, so we, we didn't focus as much on that. Okay, um, here are kind of just a couple more details of our study. Uh, everything is pretty standard. Jets are reconstructed using anti-KT. We checked a couple different jet radii. Central scale choice is the PT of the jet. Uh, we checked a few, different, a few different types of polarized PDFs, both NPDF and DSSV. We assumed 10 uh, inverse femtobarns of integrated luminosity to estimate statistical errors. We assumed some different values for EIC energies um, as shown below. And the goal of this was to kind of investigate and what can we learn from these different um, uh, EIC run parameters? And just uh, for completeness, I'll, you can understand many of the results just from this very simple plot, which maps the kinematic coverage of um, the different run parameters we've looked at into the X and Q squared plane. Okay, let me begin um, with square root of S equals the 140 GeV. Here is shown in this plot uh, the asymmetry as a function of PT of the jet. The, all the parameters are listed on the left-hand side of this plot. There's a bunch of lines shown that I will um, walk you through. So first of all, let me just note that the asymmetry varies to roughly 20% in high PT. So as you, as you know, the uh, polarized photon PDFs are not well known. In fact, they're not known at all, and typically uh, various models are used for them. Um, these models, I won't go into detail, they basically assume uh, different boundary conditions um, for the DGLAP evolution uh, that these uh, PDFs uh, satisfy. They're known in the literature as the minimal and maximal models, and uh, their results are shown as the dashed lines on this upper inset of the plot. Um, the, uh, the central value is shown with the black points 
with their associated statistical errors. The PDF errors are shown as a red hashed band. The relative size of the statistical and PDF error is more clear from the lower inset. Another thing shown on this plot is um, a blue line, which shows you the effect of taking the polarized global distribution and just setting it to zero. And the reason to do this is just to, uh, to estimate um, how sensitive this distribution is to that quantity. Okay, um, there's a few things I want to say about this. Uh, first off, holding off the polarized blue line does lead to an observable difference at intermediate PT values, and I'll make that more clear in the next couple slides. The second kind of big picture point is that the PDF errors are much larger than the estimated statistical errors. So there's really an opportunity here for uh, great measurements uh, at an AIC to improve uh, our knowledge of these distributions. Okay, this is the same plot as before, split into parclinic channels. The major thing I want to point out on this plot is the fact that if you go to intermediate values of PT of the jet, so let's say values between 10 and 25 or so, you actually have quite sizable contributions um, from the polarized gluon. That's this um, light blue band that you see in the bottom of this plot. If you go to um, high PT, you're dominated by quark lepton scattering. If you go to very low PT, you're, you're basically becoming sensitive to the resolved photon, which is unknown. However, there's kind of this sweet spot in the kinematic coverage where you can uh, access this polarized gluon. <coughs> so this slide right here um, shows you um, the effect of taking this and focusing on this intermediate PT region and turning off the polarized gluon to check the sensitivity of this, of this distribution to that quantity. You can see from comparing the black points to the blue line um, on this slide that uh, you do have good sensitivity um, to the polarized gluon from this measurement. The other interesting thing you can see from this is that um, this region of parameter space is not sensitive at all to our models of the resolved photon distribution. So some sense that you have here is a kinematic handle to access either of these distributions from this inclusive jet measurement. You go to low PT to get at the resolved photon. You go to this intermediate to high PT to get at the blue one. A few other plots uh, just to show that we studied such things as dependence on the jet radius and the PDF extraction. Uh, the left slide, the left plot shows the dependence on the uh, jet radius, um, changing it from R equals 0.8 to R equals 0.2. You can see there's not a whole lot of effect from this. This indicates that we don't expect our result to be uh, in need of any information of log R effects. That was one of the reasons to uh, do this check. The plot on the right shows you the difference between the uh, NNPDF polarized PDFs and the DSSV ones. Um, and again, uh, this is just to show that there are some observable differences um, that are actually larger than the estimated system, uh, estimated statistical errors um, between these two distributions. Okay, let me go on. I think this is my final plot. Um, actually, maybe my second to final plot. These are results for one of the lower values of square root of s. Um, same format as a previous plot. You have an asymmetry that grows to roughly 40% of high PT jet. Again, the PDF errors are still larger than the statistical errors. So you can learn a lot about polarized PDFs at this energy as well. Um, one thing that is a little bit different uh, comes when you um, look at the uh, partonic structure of this result. And uh, this shows you that partonic structure, again, as a function of PT jet. And what you can see is it's pretty much dominated completely by the quark lepton um, uh, scattering channel until you go to very low values of uh, PT jet. And in the low region of PT jet, uh, you're actually forced to disentangle things such as the polarized photon um, from the polarized gluon. <laughs> and um, this is something, I mean, this, this behavior is something you can understand uh, uh, just from the fact that you're focused on higher Bjork and X, you're forced to be at higher Bjork and X when you go to lower scattering energies. It all just follows from that. Um, so this, this is the result for square root of S equals 63. Um, the conclusions are similar um, and in fact a bit stronger um, going even lower in square root of S. And uh, these uh, plots for that energy are, are shown in the, the reference on the bottom of this slide. Okay, so let me conclude with just a couple of messages. Um, all ingredients are now available for an NLO description of both polarized and unpolarized observables. 
um, for EIC physics. Uh, one of our motivations was to show, or was, was to check, and you know what we did was check it and show it that the inclusion of NO corrections to inclusive jet production leads to the expected stabilization of the PQCD expansion um, in the unpolarized case. Um, it was interesting to us to study the sensitivity of inclusive jet production at an EIC to the polarized uh, PDFs, and um, it seemed that you can very nicely using the inclusive jet measurements, uh, separate the sensitivity to various polarized PDFs by appropriate kinematic selections. And uh, one general message we had for, at least from our, our very simple study, was that a higher energy EIC uh, leads to broader sensitivity to polarized PDFs than uh, a lower energy one. Um, that's it. Um, let me just conclude by saying uh, feedback, um, either now or by email at some point about the study uh, would be very welcome. Thank you. So some questions. So um, how um, straightforward would it be to um, extend this, first of all, to um, say identify hadrons instead of jets in the final state? Um, because, you know, especially at a lower energy EIC, one would probably um, have more like inclusive hadron studies than rather than jet studies just because Maybe experimental conditions. Um, so presumably that would involve computing an extra beam function, right? Uh, so let let me uh, yeah I'll go ahead and answer that one. Um, so this um, is it's doable. Um, I'm putting the relevant formula. Uh, I I assume you're you're looking now at slide 17. Right. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so basically what would happen in the case of uh, hadron production would be you would have a uh, matching of, instead of a perturbative jet function, you would actually have a uh, fragment, you would have a, if you wish, a uh, fragmentation function. So there would be some perturbative matching coefficients convoluted with the usual fragmentation functions that would appear in this factorization formula instead of the jet function. So that would be the, that would be the only difference basically below the cut. So these fragmentation functions are actually known at the next next leading order level. Uh, there's a paper by, uh, I think, Ritzman and Valvine where they've done this. Right. So all the ingredients for this calculation are there. And in fact, uh, for us, it's, it's work in progress. Um, so it's something that we are, we are working on. Okay, great. I, I think it's very doable. Okay, cool. And in the same uh, vein, um, presumably... Presumably, this is not limited to this specific process, which is single inclusive, right? I mean, you could extend that, first of all, I guess, to a virtual photon coming in, right? And probably even to something with a scattered lepton detected. Yes. Yeah. Make it I, a assuming PIS type of thing. Right. So this is, uh, this is extendable. I mean, the major thing that would change in uh, some of the cases you're talking about are the hard and soft functions, in particular the hard function. Right, right. Um, and these things are known. Um, the above cut contribution is a little more difficult, but known. So these are extendable. The only uh, ingredient that is currently um, missing for this kind of field in general is actually the polarized uh, gluon beam function, which is something which is kind of very, very straightforward to obtain if, if if desired, and that might be relevant um, for descriptions of RIC observables. Let's say if one cares about extending the description of uh, diegetic production at RIC to a higher order perturbation theory, you, you would need that. Right, right. Great. Thank you. Uh, maybe speak up. Um, is there any leftover T cut dependence in the technique that you're using? And if there is, um, how do you probe that uncertainty? Did you, did you hear the question? Yes, yes, I heard the question. Um, so there are power corrections um, to the factorization uh, formula. So if I, I'll just keep it on this slide. This is valid up to terms power suppressed in the scale um, tau over, uh, or the ratio of scales tau over Q. Um, you have a couple of different uh, ways of dealing with this, of understanding and reducing the impact of these power corrections. Um, one is simply to run for as small values of tau cuts as possible in order to basically make them small. Um, well, uh, that will like, blow up your logarithms in the, in the big solar term, in the other term, right? 
yeah, this is, uh, you have a delicate numerical balance you have to play between choosing tau small enough in order to reduce power corrections, yet large enough in order to um, um, not make the blogs in the other part blow up, as you say. So this is something where, you know, numerically we've studied this, uh, we can do it. You have a few other options as well. Um, one thing you can imagine doing, which has been done quite a bit in the literature, is actually fitting the power corrections. Um, their, their functional dependence on tau is known. Um, basically, at NLO, they go like uh, the leading one is tau log tau, and next to next leading order, it's tau log cube tau. So you can imagine doing the numerical fit to these, and this has been done successfully for, for many processes. A third approach, which is something that people are working on now, including us, is actually analytically calculating the leading power corrections. Um, this is known for um, color singlet processes, and there's work in progress for understanding it for jet processes as well. So I think uh, before long, there'll actually be an analytic understanding of uh, power corrections. Um, there already is for color singlet production. I think very soon there'll be it um, as well for uh, jet production. Hey, Frank, on your second to the last slide, you show very nice asymmetry for really about 63 GV, PT all the way to the 30 GV. What is the rate? Not that asymmetry. What's the rate for the cross section there? That should be very tiny, though. Um, it, be, it becomes very tiny at, uh, at high PT. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, it's, we actually show the rate in our paper or at least we show the polarized cross-section there, you're certainly right that it becomes very small. Um, you can kind of get a feel for this um, from the following uh, slide that I just put up. You can see the statistical errors start to blow up around 25 GeV or so, just, just looking at the width of the black bands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Christine? Hey, Frank. Uh, this is Christine Adela. Uh, Hi, Christine. Yeah, so you'd shown that when you turn gluon polarization off, the asymmetries get Larger? Is that there were cancellations? Sorry. Am I missing something? No, you're not, you're not missing something. Um, I, I'll, let me show it to you on, on this slide. Uh, you can see that the dominant uh, channel associated with the gluon is the gluon photon scattering channel. This is the uh, light blue curve that you see on the bottom of this plot. And you can see that it actually leads to a negative asymmetry. Okay. So, yes, you're right. Yes, yes. Photon blue and fusion is a negative. Yes, right. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Frank again.